As Ghana approaches the 2024 general elections, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, is gearing up for a pivotal battle to reclaim power from the new patriotic party after two unsuccessful attempts in 2016 and 2020. The stakes are indeed high, and the question on everyone's mind is whether 2024 will mark a turning point for the NDC. Now, with widespread dissatisfaction among Ghanaians regarding the current administration's performance, the NDC faces the challenge of converting this discontent into tangible votes. What is the NDC strategy to win back the electorate's trust? And do they have what it takes to lead the nation once again? Today's program seeks to delve into the NDC's plans, their campaign tactics, and evaluate whether they are a viable alternative for Ghana's desired state of development. I am Kemeni Amano, and in this edition of Hot Issues, I sit with the NDC's General Secretary, Fifi Fiavi Kwete. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Thank you very much, uh, Kameni. I'm happy to be here. Mm. And uh, good uh, greetings to all of your viewers all mm. over the world. Indeed. There are those who think that the NPP and NDC have done the country no good. Why do you think the NDC should be looked at differently? Um, I can understand that level of uh, uh, cynicism. Uh, what I would say, however, is that... Um, Often when people say that, especially when they are saying so during the eight-year rule of the NPP, uh, it is coming largely because a lot of those people uh, put a lot of their hope in the NPP. Uh, listen carefully to the many promises the NPP uh, gave them and cannot believe uh, the level of um, disappointment, mm. the level of uh, uh, breaking of promises uh, that they have seen. And unfortunately, instead of narrowing it to the NPP, uh, they try to put everybody in the same basket, and which I think is not right. Is that all. also not absolving the NDC of any blame as to where the country is today? Yeah, I mean, there's no uh, denying that uh, NDC is not a, a perfect political party, and we've never made any claim uh, about being perfect. But in truth, if you check what I call the DNA of the NPP and the DNA of the NDC, they're very, uh, very wide apart. Mm. Uh, whereas NDC makes an effort to show conviction in what we do. MPP, I will tell you, right from independence through to every single regime that had been in, the, in our politics has stood for what I call the politics of convenience. Mm. Effectively, they make a lot of uh, claims to being Democrats. When, the when they are in power, you show the very opposite of democracy. They claim they are pro-business. When they are in power, they do the very opposite of being pro-business. They make all kinds of statements about how easy it is to govern a country and to transform an economy. When they are given opportunity, they invariably do the very opposite of it. So it's true that the NDC is not perfect. But if you're talking about real commitment to this country, I would say, apart from the Kwame Nkrumah tradition, the tradition that has shown real faith with the mm. people of Ghana has been the NDC. So what are the achievements of the NDC? That's a good question to ask. Um, first and foremost, if you're looking at, um, let's take, for example, democratic process, democratic process. Um, you watch the NDC's rule of our country well. You'll notice, for instance, that uh, it doesn't happen in the history of our country when NDC has been in power. For journalists, and I'm talking about democratic rule, for journalists, for example, to be afraid to be able to speak under this, this, especially this government or the NPP, that actually is very pervasive. Well, why do you have that impression? Oh, but you, can, you can talk to many of your colleagues. You can talk about, for example, the journalists who got killed, uh, uh, basically in cold blood, uh, because of the work he was doing. And I'm talking about Ahmed Suale. You can talk about, what's his name, uh, award-winning journalist, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, 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 Manasi Azuri, who literally had to run away from this country. You can even talk about some of your own colleagues here in TV3 who are effectively threatened more or less because they are carrying opinion that simply is against the NPP. Mm. 
Now, the difference between the NDC and MPP in, in terms of governance is this. We, for instance, do not believe that everybody must belong to us. They believe that the country is the property. You must belong. And if you don't belong, they effectively will hound you out, persecute you, threaten you, use all kinds of men. It tells you two separate DNAs. One DNA that is more tolerant, and another one that is actually filled with nothing but intolerance in a sense that the country is a but there, But there were some excesses, and I hope that you know, we don't stay no, on this as point, I said, but there were some excesses not, we, in, in, in I say the all the time, NDC as well. I say all the time that there's no perfect uh, political system, but between the NDC and MPP, it's really sad if people actually make an effort to place us as the same. Let's talk, for example, about the economy. I mean, look, for instance, the, the, the eight years prior of the NDC and compared to the eight years that we see today. We're talking about an economy today that has become what you call a junk economy under the rule of the so-called economic messiahs. Our city today is absolutely of no value. And we're talking about a government that, as it were, created the impression that even 3.8 cities to the dollar was a crime. And today we're talking about a city that is pushing north of 15 and heading towards 16. We're talking about a government that has received in our history the highest amount of resource. I mean, if you put the resource alone, that they even got just a period of six months in COVID, between July to uh, the close of that year, 2020, that alone, the envelope alone they got, which is amounting about, about 30 billion, that is for some one, one fourth of the totality of all the loans that the NDC had in eight years. And in spite of the fact that they got this massive resource, they still led this country into a situation where we're talking about budget deficit of 15%, inflation started flying upward towards 50%, totally collapsed our country and put us in the situation in which we are today. You're talking about we with 120 billion cities, the amount of the, 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 the massive portfolio of investment in every field of our country, uh -huh. energy sector, infrastructure in roads, in education, in totality, in health, everything that you can talk about. Today, ask them to name 20 what you call high-flying projects that they've done with this resource that they've done, they cannot point to it. It tells you that the, 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 the different, and, and beyond that, beyond that, uh -huh. which is for me is more important is what I call the real character of the two of the two political parties. Whereas one makes an effort to create, uh, should I call it, um, uh, in fact, the only way I can call it, uh, they are a group that, that have absolutely no credibility. So for example, you see, they believe in sloganeering. So they come into office and throw all kinds of slogans all over the place. Uh, one V, one D, because they believe that once you throw slogans, you can deceive the people. Today, you ask where the one V, one Ds are, they are nowhere to be found. You're talking about... Their, uh, their performance tracker won't say that. Oh, I mean, the fact is that you can always claim that you've done stuff, but the reality lies in, for example, whether people in dry farming in Ghana over the last eight years could boast about using any of those so-called dams to be able to do any agriculture. You talk even about free SHS that they boast about. The arrogance... The father literally had to threaten teachers, head teachers, preventing them from speaking and bringing out the fact. Because as far as they are concerned, it is every single thing is about politics. I mean, you know that for a fact, that oh, they threatened course, the head course, teachers. Of course, of course, of course. I mean, we are in Ghana. Mm -hmm. It's like what's called the culture of silence is massive, not just happening to you in the media, but happening to people in the I educational see. sector. But I mean, if things are as bad yeah. as you're saying, mm -hmm. um, and the M MDC wants to do better. Mm -hmm. What's the plan? First and foremost, the plan is to make sure that we, uh, we place back into the heart of governance what I consider to be uh, the, the primacy of principle. You see, what MPP has sought to do is to try to let the country believe that all that matters is what you call the enunciation of policies. Now, the thing is, if you do not have principles, your policies are hollow. Because you don't even have what it takes to be able to, as it were, keep faith with policies. NDC typically puts into the very heart of every conversation the need for values, the need for principles. That's why, for example, you have us in power. When we are confronted with a problem, we do not run away from the problem. So, for example, there was doom so. And we had the courage to tell the country that, yes, there is doom so. Explain why there is so. Take responsibility for it. And then set about to resolve the problem. 
when, for example, we're in power, we never, for example, try to deceive the country by doing what I call uh, engineering of our fiscal numbers, hiding numbers, and pretending some of them were below the line mm. just because I mean, we so, wanted I mean, to so, deceive so, the country. Uh, no, I'm letting you understand obviously. the difference. The difference is that we believe in conviction and in principle. If you don't start with that foundation of principles, every single thing you do will go down the line. You will destroy the country. You will make what you call deception to become the order of the day. The chairman of the Public Accounts Committee sat in your mm -hmm. place uh, right there and told us that when you look at government's whole account, mm -hmm. there is no money. And so if you are going to inherit mm -hmm. uh, that government, the question is, where would you find the money to be able to do the things that you are promising? We've been there before. In 2009, when we took over, this country actually was in serious crisis as well. We're talking at the time that there was a debt to GDP was also quite high. The city had depreciated by over 20% when we took over. We're talking about uh, the banking sector was in serious crisis. Uh, deficit was about 15%. On commitment basis, over twenty-two percent. I mean, inflation has run towards what eighteen percent and quickly above to twenty-one. So things were absolutely in difficult as well. Mm. They were massive difficulty as well. Within a matter of what a year and a half, we were able to bring the kind of stability that led this country to have the longest period, what you call, of inflation being in single digit in our history. We brought what you call stability to the currency as well. We had GDP that was accelerating. We were able to leave what you call massive, what you call uh, legacy in terms of every sector, uh, in terms of cocoa production, in terms of even what you call the buffer stock that they came and were boosting about, right. left to them, uh, uh, how do you call it, a huge portfolio of investment. Is the NDC overpromising? So we have. The promises we are making are not promises that cannot be realized. For example, if we tell you that we can bring, the, we can bring a resolution to free SHS, but ensuring that we listen to what the stakeholders, the stakeholders who absolutely are agreeing that there are challenges, that is important for a proper conversation mm. to be had in order to bring that uh, whole policy to a place where quality can become much more enhanced. It's not a promise that cannot be delivered. When we talk about the fact that the economy, we want to, for example, reduce expenditure by dealing, for example, the number of people who are being employed, for mm -hmm. example, in government. It's not a promise that cannot, be, that cannot be delivered. When we say we want to reduce, for example, the staffing, uh, the number of staffers you have at the presidency, it can actually be delivered. I so see. I'm saying that we have been there and we've been able to do it in you the past. You have the track and you, record. And you check our track record that tells you that we are capable of doing I it see. again. In order for you to be able to do this in the first place, mm -hmm. you're going to have to win the 2024 elections. True. So let's talk about the campaign team that you outdoored recently. What, okay. what were the considerations that the Functional Executive Committee made in choosing these people? Um, you must appreciate that we, we have a very, very, very difficult campaign ahead of us because we are dealing with an opponent that obviously is very desperate. Desperate because they clearly do know that they have massively underperformed. Not only have they underperformed, but it's also shown a lot of corruption. So naturally, they are scared. They are scared that what you call the will of the people of Ghana is not for them to lose power, but actually for them to be prosecuted, to set an example for all other politicians in the future that never shall you have access to power and do the kind of things that have been done over the last eight years. And if MPP become desperate, then MPP is absolutely uh, a party to be feared. Uh, we in the NDC know that because uh, I mean, the last time we took MPP out of power, we saw exactly how difficult it was to be able to take them out, even mm -hmm. when it was clear that they were losing power. In the very final moment, the strong room of the electoral commission, they did everything possible to steal that election. If it were not for massive vigilance on our part and the strength of Afarijan, they would have absolutely stolen that election in 2008. So it requires, therefore, that you are putting together a team of people who understand what it takes. I mean, people who absolutely are ready to do 100% plus work, people who are diligent, people who know what it takes, the level of loyalty, the level of commitment. So I would say that all these considerations came into place. Mm. We also appreciate that it's not simply going to just be about business as usual, the normal thing that we did. So you could see a bit of changes in the way we approach it. So for example, we are putting this election in a way that is what you call a different level of coordination.
In the past, we used to have, for example, one person was in charge of the campaign, and that person invariably tended to be very attached to the flag bearer. Mm -hmm. And we realized that that may not always be the, uh, the ideal thing to do, because they should be what I call a central pivot. That is in charge of viewing every single thing that is going on, looking at different angles, and finding ways to harmonize the different movements that are going across the country. So this structure you are seeing, you are seeing a structure that is under the general secretary as a campaign coordinator. You have different teams that are, so you have a team that is working with the flag bearer. You have a team that's working with the running man. We are going to also have a party team that is also going to be in charge of movement. Then you have different teams that are in charge of parliamentary campaigns. So right. that is, they are going to be their focus. Focus purely on what's going on at the parliamentary level, where there are problems, where there are challenges, find ways to be able to resolve it. We but, have also got strategic mm. operation that is going to be in charge of many things that are critical all the way down to the polling stations on the D day. Mm. So we, we but, have that very well thought out and it, very it, well conceived. And it, it, and it will look like so but also uh, we, we can't help but notice the lack of female representation uh, in, in, your in your lineup. Um, I mean, when you look at the, the list that you provided, How so? um, and I'm talking about the core campaign team, yeah. it would seem that we don't have a lot of women there. We have, uh, about, five, we have about five women who are in the core campaign pa pa team. Particularly, I mean, when you look at... Uh, 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 um, Professor Jane Nana, the running mate, Professor mm -hmm. Jane Nana Opoku yeah. team, mm -hmm. uh, you know, comparatively, there are more men there than women. And, and Jomama saying there are more women there than I mean, men. I could count, count uh, two top of my, my mind team? right now on, on John Mahama's team. Sure, and, mm -hmm. and so you can see a balance there. So uh, the lady has men supporting, the gentleman has women supporting. It's a beautiful balance. No way. I John mean, Mahama you're, you're, has two, you're rationalizing John, no, that John now. Mahama, John Mahama has two spokespersons. One is Joyce Bauer. The deputy is Beatrice Ananfio. Uh, the running mate, mm -hmm. Prof. Nana Jane, has two spokespersons. One is James Ajeni And you're the telling me that Eric. was intentional. So, Sassi, that's a beautiful balance. You, no, you're telling me that was intentional. It's a beautiful balance. After, or, after or, the fact. No, it's not after the fact. We clearly knew that two powerful women supporting the flabera two powerful men supporting the running men that's beautiful balance. i see but how many how many people in total are on the campaign team 19 19 yeah. and you have only five women five that's not good enough uh, we wish we could do more and um why, could you, be, why couldn't you do were, more no you know you you also must appreciate that um a lot of the people who are in in those campaign team also happen to be people who are occupying particular positions so for example if you have a national organizer a national organizer happen to be male the national communication officer happened to be male. The national youth organizer happened to be male. So there are positions that are clearly coming according to rules that are already being paid. You can't force that. Mm. You understand? So you have a national women organizer. She occupies a role and accordingly is in that. So there's not like a deliberate attempt to not to include women. But it happens to be positions. So what we urge is that we need to have a lot more of our women who are pushing to be able to, for example, become general secretary of the party, to become mm. national organizer of the party, and not simply to be women organizer. Across all... The, uh, I mean, I, but, I, I would but, say it's, but, not, but, it's, not, it's not just a Ghana... It's not just a Ghana issue, I, I I, and I, agree I would think with it's, you. A global, I mean, what, it's a global what, what issue. What is the NBC doing issue. to ensure that more women rise to the top within the party? Oh, I mean, that's exactly what we... That, we that what you see is the beginning. I mean, we, we are going to encourage a lot more. So, for example, we are always very happy when we see women who are occupying positions beyond national women organizers. There are a number of women who are, who are even... who have chairmen. We have some who are vices, some of them are, are, are general secretaries, I mean secretaries in various mm. positions, so we encourage a lot more. Mm. I mean, I see. It, it, you must always appreciate, it must not always be also an issue of, um, uh, it, should not be, it should not be done in terms of, uh, how would I call it, uh, uh, women, are, women are being uh, handed these positions as if it is a favor being done to them. No, women literally have to rise and show that they can take the position and they'll be encouraged. When you look at last year, the NPP won only in Northeast. I mean, in the last election, the NPP won only in the North, in Northeast as far as the presidential race is concerned. Mm -hmm. Now, when I, when I uh, look at the, um, the idea of wanting to um, lead in the Northern region and I compare that to your campaign team, it will seem as though uh, uh, what people say, that there is no representation of that in the makeup of the campaign t team is true. In what way? In, in, in the sense that you don't have a lot of Northern representation there as well. I mean, who, who is going to lead the team 
there to make that win possible. Don't you? You must appreciate that we have what you call 16 regions in our country. Mm -hmm. And uh, the calculation is not to have 16 people coming from 16 regions to be on the, on the, on the campaign team. You, 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 can, you can have it that way. As I told you already, the composition of the, of the uh, shall I call it, the campaign team already is, is held on the back of key positions. So if you happen to have a national communication officer, national youth organizer, national general secretary, the regions they come from automatically occupy that. What? Otherwise, you're going to have a very unwieldy uh, uh, composition. And our, our intention was no. Don't also forget. I mean, perhaps I should aim, be more direct. The calculation is us. What you have at the national is supported by different things that are happening at the regional levels. Mm. And each region is going to have a specific team that is working to the national. Now, so that is actually the calculation to make sure, for example, you are not loading it with any particular region because you have regional emphasis to make sure the job get done at the regional level. Why isn't, uh, you know, former minority leader uh, Haruna Idrusu on your campaign team? Have you seen any MP on the campaign team? Is, is there a reason for that? Because we want the MPs to concentrate. Mm. I've been an MP before. And I've nev I never would have understood if somebody took me from my uh, constituency and made me a member of the national campaign. That would have been absolutely uh, ill thought of. Because so that your, is, that is your responsibility as MP is to focus on your constituency and ensure you deliver that constituency as much as you can, possibly extend beyond your constituency to help adjoining constituencies and help your region. Mm -hmm. So it's, you could see clearly that there is no MP as far as the campaign team is concerned. I can appreciate uh, the desperation of our opponents on the other side. Clearly, they have nothing to say. So they've been in the back of all this. Oh, why is Haruna not saying? Why is Munta Kanos? It's part of the mischief. It's just nothing but mischief. I see. What is the strategy to ensure that you are able to convert, convert the sentiment to actual vote? for you, you know, come December 7th? I can't give you all of it, but what I can tell you is that uh, we, we are not taking anything at all for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate that the sentiments uh, in the country are for change, but we also do know that until you cross the line, uh, you haven't won it at all. So we are making sure we leave no stone unturned. I can't disclose more than that. All I can tell you is that we are not going to simply sit on the back of the sentiment that uh, are expressing a, a desire for change. But we want to work super hard to win the heart and minds of the people of Ghana across all the regions. Does, uh, does the to... NDC have the ability to convert, convert the sentiments amongst the Ghanaian people now into actual votes for them? Absolutely. I mean, if you can do that, then we have no reason being a political party. We've done it in the past, and we are capable of doing it today. I mean, if we didn't have that capacity, there's no way MPP would have been out of power the last time when they were. And even if you watch even in 2020, despite all the shenanigans that went on, despite the killing of eight people simply because there was a party desperate to remain in power at all costs, NDC showed clearly, especially at the level of the parliamentary, that we actually won that election uh, by a minimum of one in 45 seats despite what you see happening in Parliament today. So it tells you as a machinery, uh, we're a group that knows how to work super hard and we, extend, we intend to do uh, even more in 2024. When we come back, I want us to talk about the 2024 elections proper. Okay. You're watching Hot Issues, don't go away. My guest on the program today is Fifi Fiavi Kwete and he's the general secretary of the NDC. Thank you so much for your patience. So, I mean, you have your, your campaign team now. Mm -hmm. They've got their campaign message. Mm -hmm. uh, is it still the 24-hour economy? It's among a uh, number of other messages. So, so what, I mean, so what's the message you're going to be selling, really? I would say that I, would, I would want you to wait. Uh, let us uh, properly launch the campaign and launch our manifesto. Mm. With the manifesto, we'll be coming out for a proper policy platform. When are you launching so let the me manifesto? Know. I would say that we'll be doing so. Uh, the exact date we'll announce to the public soon. I see. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about elections 2024. You have said that you acknowledge it's not going to be an easy race, but mm -hmm. how challenging do you think it will be for the NDC? It is. It's going to be very challenging. Uh, beating the MPP has always been a very tough task. And especially when MPP becomes even more desperate. And as I explained to you, they are far more desperate now than they were in 2008 when we last beat them. Because why? They've committed far more uh, 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 wrong things against the people of Ghana. 
and they are clearly very afraid because they know Ghana is united to ensure that not just they do not just lose power, but they are punished for the things that they've done. So naturally, that makes them very, very desperate. So when you hear them shouting, it is possible, it is because they know that it is possible to try to rig again. It is possible to try to use shenanigan again. It is possible hoping to use what you call deception to be able to deceive the people again. So we are aware. And because of that, we are definitely going to make sure we work even extra hard uh, mm. to take them out. One of the challenges that uh, or difficulties that mm -hmm. the NDC had in the 2020 election had to do with collation. Um, how have you resolved that? I can tell you that uh, that is definitely not going to be a problem this time around. And uh, we shown a, a little indication of that even in the two by-elections that we had. Uh, the most recent being uh, the Asin, Asin North by-election, where NDC was ahead of both the Electoral Commission and MPP in terms of the coalition of our result. So as far as that is concerned, I can assure you it's not going to happen. Uh, and again, I mean, it's not... I would say in 2008, NDC was way ahead of MPP in terms of coalition of results. In fact, it was because we collated our results way early. Mm -hmm. That's how can we were able to stop them when they tried to steal the election in the strong room in the last minute. In 2012, we did the same. So let's just say that what happened in the last election is a, it's a temporary blip. And we are, what you call, resuming normal service, mm -hmm. uh, which NDC normally is known for, making sure that we get our results way we, 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 we're on time. What's your relationship with the Electoral Commission uh, like at the moment? Uh, it's a very, shall I call it, uh, it's, a, it's a relationship that I would say uh, is difficult. Why? Because there's no trust. There's no trust at all because uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, the winner Nakufuadu has gone about uh, business with the Electoral Commission. That is not how you govern a country. You, you, I mean, we've been in this country since 1992. We've not seen a situation where uh, you have, for example, people who clearly align to a particular political party, not just even in a very covert manner, but clearly open alignment to political parties, are the commissioners who are supposed to be in charge of an election. That's unfortunately what we have at the moment. And what's given the MP, NDC that impression? That you know. Oh, I'm sure you do know. I mean, you know, for example, that one of uh, the recent appointment was to take somebody who is known as a, uh, I think he works with either the MPP election directory, and also is a communicator on MPP in the Brongahafo region, who happened to be one of the commissioners. You have, for example, Bossman, who is actually known as a true and true NPP man, who even came out in his own pronouncement declaring that NDC absolutely is a, is a danger to Ghana's democracy. Now, if you have people like that who are supposed to be in charge of the elections of a country, people who clearly have a business to ensure that the NPP wins power, you obviously cannot afford to, to, to trust them. Mm -hmm. So clearly we do not trust them. Kodeo has, so, Kodeo has said that the Electoral Commission is trustworthy, they can deliver a credible 2024 uh, elections and that, you know, the position of the NDC at the moment is just typical of a party in opposition. Kodeo can say what Kodeo wants. As far as we are concerned, if you have people who belong to MPP who are supposed in charge of the elections, you are going to be very, uh, uh, shall I call it, naive to want to trust them. So you have to make sure you enter this election, like I, like I say regularly, like how Azuma entered into that interest, that very critical battle in Australia, uh, where Azuma took his own punches into the ring, and the punches were the judges, and ensured that as uh, he did justice, I mean, and, and to, took the victory away from, from, from a tough opponent. That's how we want to go about it. Like uh, Aflabera declared, uh, we are not going to be waiting for any Supreme Court to make any determination this time around. We want to make sure we win it right at the polling station and ensure that the votes are counted and the votes are absolutely protected mm. in order for the, for the real will of the people to be made manifest. It's easy to rationalize the NDC's position or view of the Electoral Commission as one that, it, it, unless the Commission announces you as winners of the 2024 elections, then you cannot believe the results that come out. No, that's not exactly the truth at all. I mean, we're talking about an Electoral Commission that uh, will have a situation where critical uh, devices that are used, for example, in an election, uh, vanish under very mysterious circumstances in a room that is actually filled with CCTV cameras. And the Electoral Commission up to today has not been able to give any indication as to how that happened, who are those involved, what investigations they play, whether they are retrieving all the information. 
You don't want to trust the electoral mm -hmm. commission. Okay. You're talking about an electoral commission that cannot declare results. In 2020, you have how many times they did, of the same result, versions of that result that were, that were put out in the public. That electoral commission clearly I mean, shows on not the, to on have... On the sub subject of the missing devices, the opposition has been that uh, the police is looking into that matter. The thing is this. If it were not even for the NDC coming out in the first place, the country would never have known about it. It tells you that these people clearly are not in, interested in telling the truth. If it had to take NDC at a press conference for them to admit what had happened, how many more things are happening that is not coming out in the open that we are supposed to know about. So you ca they cannot be trusted. And then it would be a big mistake mm. on the part of NDC uh, to trust them. Really? Absolutely. And then the party had asked for the serial numbers for the biometric devices. Mm -hmm. That was rejected by the electoral commission. Mm -hmm. Then the party came back to say you you find you 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 know you have your own way of finding them. Mm -hmm. Do you have them now? Even if we do, we're not going to tell you. <laughs> but how do you plan to get them? Leave leave that to us. It sounds illegal. It does not. It does not at all. But leave that to us. The electoral commission, even when we were the recent uh, uh, registration that took place, many many times we were those who were in front of the curve letting them even know mistakes that they were making. And we came out to the public to announce that here, even your additions are not right, your numbers are not right. It tells you that we clearly are very determined this time around. Mm. Once beaten, twice shy. Mm. I see. What can the commission do to, you know, rebuild that trust? The commission, first and foremost, must um, appreciate once and for all that its job is not to try to win election for anybody. We do not expect the commission to win an election for NDC. The same way we don't expect the commission to win an election for the MPP. Its job is simply to be a neutral, independent, professional body. So that's important. Two, to appreciate that IPAC has been a time-honored institution that always was there to help resolve issues. Unfortunately, the posture of Jean Mensah, a good friend of mine in the, in the I mean, to begin with, uh, has been one that literally tried to remove that tradition of the IPA being a, what you call a consensus building uh, a body mm -hmm. into becoming a body that whatever the electoral commission decides, that really has to just be rammed through that particular body. I'm happy that there's been an effort to move back towards that consensus building. I would say that's a positive development and we need to see a lot more of that. We did not need to have departed from that to begin with. But it's better late than ever. So we're happy about the, the recent development relating to making an effort for that body to become a place where issues can be properly discussed and decisions are arrived at. And if there is no consensus, you want to hold back until there is a consensus, then you can move forward. So I would say that uh, a lot more is expected. Uh, but uh, between now and December, we have made a decision uh, to keep our eyes very wide open. We appreciate that we are facing a big opponent, and that opponent clearly may be having the Electoral Commission back in it, and therefore we are facing two opponents, and we are ready. Mm, I see you're ready. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the Ashanti region and, uh, you know, the NDC's bid to also hit home run there. Mm -hmm. um, if the NPP mm -hmm. chooses a running mate mm -hmm. like Energy Minister Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, mm -hmm that dampens your ability to claw votes in the Ashanti region, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. You're not afraid of... It mm, doesn't. It does not at all. I mean, what is, what is spectacular about Matteo Pogumprepe? He's been in charge of the energy sector. He has not even got the honor and the capacity to accept that we have an energy crisis. Is that not a massive, what you call, uh, absence of principles? If you have an individual who simply hasn't got the courage to tell the truth, joining a flatbed who himself is known for what you call perpetual deception and lies, we're talking about a, a, a team that is simply not known for honor. But, but you so I don't understand why anybody will panic over that. And it's not also an issue of tribe. No, but you the cannot, people in Ashanti... You cannot, hang on. You, can't, you cannot deny his yeah. ability to, you know, garner the kind of support the NPP needs in the Ashanti region at the moment. Do you actually think that the people in Ashanti region are not feeling what I call the massive suffering that is going on in this country? Their businesses are not collapsing. 
I mean, their suffering has not been exacerbated. I think we should actually credit the people of Ashanti region, just as we should credit everybody in this country, that they absolutely know what is going on in Ghana. So simply because you've chosen somebody who is coming from Ashanti does not take away what they've gone through over the last eight years. Mm -hmm. The massive suffering, the massive uh, breakdown, I mean, in law and all that, the massive disappointment, they also are feeling it. They are going to the market like everybody else. So I don't think at all we need to think, we need, we need to think that way. After all, if it were as simple as that, then President Kufo would not have lost election because he was an Ashanti who was a flat bearer, but he lost election in Ghana. Mm, I see. Yeah. I want to look at the performance of the, um, you know, the NDC mm -hmm. in the last election, in the Ashanti region, in the presidential race. Of course, you had a gain of 3.5%, mm -hmm. uh, but the percentage that you clawed from that area is 26 point. Uh, five percent compared mm -hmm. to about 72 mm -hmm. and, and so i mean the data does not support your mm -hmm. ability to get the votes even with all the sentiments you're talking about yeah but about. what you are not aware of is that if there is a place where the most massive stealing of vote happens in this country it's a shanty region that's a stronghold of our opponents and i've already established to you that if there's any political party that simply is what you call desperate about rigging and elections, the NPP. And I'll give you an example of what happened in 2008. In 2008, in that critical moment when they were stealing the vote, do you know where the votes, uh, where the shenanigans was happening? It's coming from Ashanti region, from Kumasi. That's where they were changing results that already been declared. So we know what is done in Ashanti. We know that that vote you are saying there, a lot of it is stealing and vote pardon. Mm. And this election, you watch. And you think they could be doing that again? Just watch. They will try. As for trying, we know they will, but we are ready. Mm, I see. Let's we move away from them. the Ashanti mm. region and talk about the Volta region, what you also would describe as your World Bank. Mm -hmm. How do you think your support is there right now? Let me say it this way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a national thing that is going on. We're talking about Ghana united against a government that have absolutely disappointed. So what is happening in the voter region is no different from what's happening in other parts of the country. So our message is not directed at a particular region at all. We are talking about Ghana. You need to come together to ensure that this plague known as the NPP loses power, that we are united to ensure that this plague known as the NPP is punished to set an example for the rest of the country. So I would say that our message is the same message that we are sending across the country, that enough of the suffering, enough of the, of the destruction of the economy, enough of what you call the lack of credibility, enough of uh, uh, what is going on in the, in the economy as a whole. So therefore, do what you can to ensure that there is an end to this suffering by taking the MPP out. I mean, what are you doing there to ensure that you do not um, get more losses like you suffered in the last election, despite winning overall? In the which voter region. I mean, I want to talk again yeah, the, the voter region. The the difference between your win in 2020 and 2016 was 2.9, which means that obviously there are people who had, uh, you know, clawed back from voting uh, for you. Actually, it's not as simple as that. What people do not appreciate is that uh, ahead of 2020, the party instructed that people from the voter region who especially reside in Greater Accra and, some, and also part in Eastern region should not move back to voter region for elections. So it was deliberate policy on the part mm. of the party. Why? Because we believe that, listen, our seats are secure in the voter region. So we don't need people moving from Greater Accra to go and vote to help us win seats. But we need them to be able to stay in other places where seats can be won. So when you see the numbers in voter region, you need to also take into account that the numbers you see, first of all, we're talking about Voter used to be voter NOT. So the result itself is, mm -hmm. I mean, what you see now is just voter NOT separate. So you need to put the two together vis a vis the previous numbers. Two, you also take to, you have to take into mm -hmm. consideration what I just said, that we deliberately, and we've done the same thing for 2024, mm -hmm. instructing a lot of our people from the voter region don't troop back to go and vote. Keep your vote in other places, Greater Accra, Eastern Region, in order to be able to help us win more difficult. I mean seats. that makes sense. Yeah. But despite what you have said, we know that the NPP is also making inroads. If the data is correct, they had a gain in the voter region of three point three percent 
and, and they probably hope, in fact, they do hope to increase that number as well. well it's normal. NDC means gain in Ashanti. NDC means gains in Eastern region. So it's not anything unusual at all. Once you're having a, what you call a larger population growth, you definitely are getting people who are clearly aligned with MPP as well. Right. So, which so, is, I mean, which is so not I'm, what I'm trying to understand yeah. is you have got to have a strategy to want to ensure that you do not lose too much ground in your World Bank. What is that strategy? I would just say that the same strategy we are using across the country which is simply to give a message, the message that there's a need for change, there's a uh -huh. need for, for, for working hard to ensure that the MPP loses. Mm. Uh, and that's the same message, the same message we have in the North, the same message we have in Central Region, the same message we have in Western Region. I mean, it's the same but, but ear to the ground, mm -hmm. it would seem that uh, some voters in the Volta Region are disillusioned uh, because they think that, you know, they give you all the votes and yet when you come, you don't do uh, anything for them. So today I want to ask you, what are the achievements of the NDC or what kind of developments have you sent to uh, that part of the country? You know, it's, it's all part of the, uh, what I call the spinning that goes on across the country. I mean, if you go into voter region, there is, you can count how many things MPP has done for that region vis-a-vis -vis the NDC. For example, if you go into my constituency where I used to be the MP, I mean, the kind of things that I did even as MP are some of the things that uh, the MPP national tracker counts as achievement. In fact, things that are being done by assembly men under us is what MPP counts as part of their national accomplishment and so on. So quite a lot has been done. But of course, you must appreciate there's always the need for more. So the people in the Volta region naturally want more, the same way every other region wants more. As much as possible, we need to move this conversation away from um, uh, uh, because it's the stronghold, therefore you must do more in the stronghold than you do in other places. NDC is a party that's a very broad-based party, so you want to make sure that development is across the country. I mean, and uh, every area has to receive according to what you call the needs of that area. Uh, unlike the NPP, that thinks that development has to always be skewed to one side. We in NDC believe that the whole country is our, our, our stronghold. We need to ensure that as well, much I mean, as I, much I, I, is I done doubt in that because area. the people of the Ashanti region will say, say the same thing about, about the NPP also, way? that you know, they, they are not developing what is supposed to be their world bank. Look at even the composition. Let's talk about the water region. Look at even, the, comp region, look at even right? the composition of even their, their how do you call it, the, uh, number of people they have, for example, in government. As opposed to NDC, that makes it very broad. Mm -hmm. MPP absolutely can just fill the whole of their government with people from two regions and sprinkle a little across the other side. NDC has never been there. We always are very uniform in terms of how many people are in our government. Mm. The same way and, when it comes to development. You know, and, and I understand you do that, the same but thing. I want you to speak specifically to your voters in the Volta region. Um, who probably feel neglected. Because one of the things that I've heard uh, voters there say is that it would seem the development died with Rollins or it went, you know, it exited with, with Rollins when he... Uh, Actually, that's even not the truth at all. Mm -hmm. Because in truth, uh, there's far more development that had gone to voter region post Rollins than it's happened during Rollins. I see. If you appreciate, Rollins always felt that it was not right to make it a safe because he came from Volta. Mm -hmm. He needed to put development in Volta more than in other places, mm -hmm. which actually is what noble leaders do. Uh, MPP has shown us that is the opposite. What I would say is this, that we will work hard to continue what Prof. Mill started, to continue what John Mahama started in terms of making sure all parts of the country are well attended to. Mm -hmm. And that's all I can say for now. We've been in this country when certain remarks were made mm -hmm. about how voters were uh, prevented from voting in the Volta region. Mm -hmm. How seriously did the NDC take that comment? It's not something that's happened just in the last election. MPP does that anytime they're in power. I remember in 2008 when we took them out, they, blocked, they, they closed only the eastern border. They left the western border, they left the northern border. I'm sure if, if somehow Everest were in the sea, they would have closed the southern border as well. It just so happened that the sea hasn't got any humans, so they left the southern border, but the only border that they closed was the eastern border. So we are used to that. Mm. Uh, our people clearly do know exactly what it is. I mean, the constant uh, thinking that somehow uh, they are not from Ghana, and therefore everything must be done to, to, to suppress them and so on. But it's okay. It's part of the MPP's uh, uh, DNA. Let's talk about the electoral polls when mm. we come back. Okay. Don't go away.
Today I'm sitting with General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi Fiavi Kwete. Thank you so much for uh, your patience, really. It's my pleasure. Is the NDC sponsoring Musa Dankwa of Global Info Analytics to give us the kind of uh, polls that it releases, putting the NDC in the lead? I mean, what, what purpose will it serve us if we get, got somebody to be putting polls that are not true? Mm. Uh, and to what purpose? What purpose, I mean, how would I, how would I, I mean, what benefit would I, would I give us? Because I actually believe that we should rather be in a position when you are in opposition to, perf to, to work even harder, feeling that there is a champion and you need to get into that ring and defeat the champion. Mm. So what's the point of creating an impression that is rather an easy win for you, which will actually make you complacent? So we have no incentive at all to make anybody uh, work for us. Mm. We actually need to be able to see the reality. Often we want to even see the worst case scenario that should be able to make us work even extra hard. So what was he doing at Volta Serene Hotel with your MPs? I mean, why, sh why should there be a problem? If the person performs, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, a job that is technical in nature, mm. different people, for example, can call you. For example, if I'm an MP, I want you to help do a poll in my community to know exactly how I'm doing, I should be able to reach out to you. Mm, I do I not see. think that MPP will call him for a program or the MPs will call him for a program, he will say no. Mm, I mean, I so see. basically it's a technical, technical oh. responsibility. How, how significant is electoral polling for, you know, the NDC in the CS elections? Uh, as General Secretary of the Party, I will tell you mm. that uh, it would be wrong to want to... Uh, uh, put any, shall I call it, um, any emphasis on polls. For us, it's simply a way for us to have an idea in order to be able to know where we need to work and where we don't, where, where things need to be done better mm. and stuff like that. So that's really what it is with us. Uh, we've seen so many polls in the history of our country mm. and they don't always turn out to be, to be correct. Mm. At the end of the day, the only poll that really matters is what the people do on that election day. Uh, so uh, I can tell you, as, a, as an individual myself who have run different elections, you do polls, but you don't simply uh, believe that on the back of those polls, the job is done. You have to just work hard. You have to presume that the polls may be wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you check, for example, the recent history of even America, for instance, where polls have been known to be very accurate. In the last two elections, the polls actually tended to be absolutely against. Uh, uh, the polls were not able to reflect, uh, I mean, what the real sentiments of the people are. So, as a party, we will listen to polls, but trust me, we will not put our 100% uh, 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 confidence on the numbers. We I want see. to just work super hard. One of the latest polls we have seen uh, that, were, that was done in the NPP stronghold. Uh, about a month ago. Okay. Uh, Okainkwe Central, Okainkwe mm -hmm. South, Anyaso Utum and Trobo, all in the greater Accra region. The trend we are seeing there, based on this poll, mm -hmm. is that the voters are, you know, voting split tickets. Mm -hmm. So it would seem that while uh, John Dramani Mahama is winning in the presidential race, mm -hmm. in the parliamentary race, uh, you know, the N MPP is winning there. But that's also indicative, and, and you can react to that, but that's also indi indicative mm -hmm. of the fact that it would seem that the, the bulk of the attention is on the presidential ticket than the parliamentary ticket. Uh, what, what is the NP NDC's vision uh, for the next parliament, really, as far as your numbers are concerned? That you can see that we actually have uh, one of the deputy... Uh, campaign coordinators being fully in charge of the parliamentary campaign. It tells you that as opposed to even the last election where we did not really have that, mm -hmm. this time we want to pay particular attention to the parliamentary campaign. Because we do appreciate that MPP is trying super hard to win the presidential. Their calculation is that in case they are not able to win the presidential, at least they should be able to have enough numbers to mm -hmm. make the country ungovernable. So we are aware. So therefore, we are not going to, as it were, be complacent at all on the parliamentary uh, 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 elections and the campaigns. That's why we have a whole deputy whose job is to monitor that 24-7 in order for us to be able to find 
what needs to be done in different places, whether they need for reinforcement, whether they need for uh, different groups in the party to go to particular places in order to find solutions and so on. So as I said again, the polls for us simply gives us an idea of things are, we are not saying for the fact that we, we know them to be 100% true, mm. but it gives us an indication and helps us to be able to work out. 276 uh, for the next parliament. How many seats are you seeing the NDC occupy? All I can say is that we want to win majority. Uh, uh, we want to win the presidential and also win majority. As to exactly the number of seats that we win to be able to get a majority, I would just say that we'll keep that close to our chests. But the important thing for us to ensure that John Mahama gets access to a majority in parliament mm. in order to be able to uh, ensure that he's able to do his job very well. I want to talk about the AG's lead tape, okay. which the NDC published. Mm -hmm. Did it achieve what you were hoping it will achieve? Does truth achieve what you expect truth to achieve? Because it's just the truth. We needed the country to understand uh, what is going on in our country. Uh, the level of desperation that we see as far as the ruling government is concerned. Which for us really is not the first time. Because remember, we're talking again about a, a group. The last time when they were in office, they categorically declared that the reason why they were taking the NDC ministers through the fast track prosecution was to ensure that by the time that prosecution was over, NDC as a party ceased to exist. It tells you who they are. The DNA is simply, when they have opportunity, destroy your opponents. So that, if you understand that DNA, mm. you, you should appreciate exactly the aim of what they are doing. Their aim is not about justice. Where you hope Their aim is a political witch hunt. Their aim is a political machine, uh, what you call, uh, 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 I mean, a calculation, hoping to be able to, to, as it were, affect the morale of the NDC, mm -hmm. create the impression that NDC is a, is a party made up of corrupt people. So pure politics, that's what it is. So the aim of uh, coming out with that is simply to let the country appreciate that that's exactly what they are doing. They are not after justice. They are basically just after political persecution of people. Were you hoping that the tape will throw out the case? No, we wanted the people of Ghana to know exactly what is going on. That's mm -hmm. all that matters. As to throwing out the case, those are uh, judicial issues. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is in the bosom of the judges. Mm -hmm. So we could not determine that. But we felt it was important for the truth to be known. We wanted the country to know exactly what uh, Godfrey Dami is. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted the country to appreciate that he's basically working on behalf of the president and his government. And what he's doing is nothing to do with justice. It's something to do with political persecution and there's no problem jailing even an innocent man once they can achieve their political objective. That's the aim and we believe that that aim has been achieved. Mm. The position of the court is that while all these things are said, it will seem they are only insinuations because on the face of the ev evidence presented in court, the AG didn't say any of that. It was the third accused person who said those things? The AG didn't say that if you follow, if I, if you follow my theory of the case, you are not going to be in trouble. That's a, that's evidence. That's also in evidence. Is that it's, in evidence? That was part of the tape. If mm. you follow my theory of the case, you are not going to be in trouble. Mm. You are not going to be held in trouble. It's pretty obvious. Now, so anyway, we leave we leave the judge to do what he's got to do. But the the public out there have listened to that tape. Mm. Now, if the judge says he doesn't know that this AG was literally getting a witness to lie, to deceive the judge, that's for the judge himself to decide, to, I mean, for, I mean for, for she herself to, to, to determine. I mean, obviously. But, you know, your MPs have said that we, we will be in court to support her to force him throughout the process instead mm -hmm. of sitting in parliament. Yeah. Why? How does that help the country? Why not? Why not? You're talking about a minority leader mm -hmm. who actually has duties to perform in parliament. Even on critical days, for example, when, for example, parliament uh, uh, res resume, when minority leader has official responsibility, he's supposed to still be in court. Why not? So the minority is saying, you know what? There's no problem. We can always find ways in which we can work. But for those moments that he's going to be in court, we want to make sure we are there to solidarize mm -hmm. with him. That's the position of the party, and the party, yeah, the party fully uh, endorses that position of the minority. Do you think the scheduling of his court dates is intentional to affect his work in parliament? The thing is that you cannot put anything past um, this very desperate uh, regime that we are, we are operating into. I've just told you that these are people who 
with DNA is that every opportunity you get, you must destroy your opponent. And for them, if you cannot destroy your opponent through bribery, if you cannot, dis de if you cannot destroy them through deception, if you are able to, as it were, manipulate the court processes in order to be able to jail them, that will help you achieve your aim. Mm. So I can't put anything past them. Has the hands of our hotels demonstration achieved the kind of results that you are hoping it would? Uh, again, very similar to uh, what you asked earlier about mm. the tapes that were uh, played uh, by the leadership of uh, the NDC. Uh, the aim always is to make sure we sensitize the people of Ghana. Uh, let the people of Ghana know the levels of uh, greed, the level of uh, abuse of power that we have seen uh, uh, in this government. The fact that you can have what you call a serving cabinet minister uh, who even hasn't got any problem wanting to acquire, okay, or his company acquire a stake in hotels owned by the workers of Ghana. Mm. It's simply it's something so shocking I can't even understand it. And the fact that even the president would as it were not call off that, that this will not have even taken, I mean, five minutes in the, mm. under, under the NDC government. You will not even dare a minister in the NDC government, you want to acquire while in power, a stake in, in what you call an institution that belong to the workers of Ghana. That would never have happened. Mm -hmm. But we deal with a group that, has, that is so brazen in what they do. We're talking about the same individual who was implicated in there. I also was work on, uh, uh, should I call it, uh, the brutalities that happened. Mm -hmm. When he was then what you call a minister at the, at the national, national security. security. The same levels of impunity. So for me, it's not, it's not a problem. If he can get away with that, why wouldn't he think that he can do anything? And the president has nothing to say about it. it. Is the, is the uh, uh, president's meeting with organized labor good progress to ensuring that this deal falls through? I don't even understand why he has to be meeting uh, 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 workers. Take a bold decision and say, under my government, that will not happen. Because this is simply wrong. That's what you do. I mean, this is trying to meet organized labor for what? What you are doing is wrong. What you are doing is immoral. What you are doing is unacceptable. It's unethical. Take a decision. You don't need to meet organized labor to have any conversation about this. But I'm not surprised. Mm. I mean, you have a situation where the president's daughter owns what is a multi-million restaurant not far from uh, the premises of TV3. The same uh, daughter of the president who would not have been able to own anything close to that when they were not in office. How, what, what moral authority has that president to be able to even stop any minister from doing the kind of thing that we are saying? So we are talking about a system that is rotten from the top, from the president all the way through to every aspect of his government. Mm, I see. Well, you know, the other leg of this you know, sale of the hotel is the involvement of uh, Freddie Blay's son. Uh, Fred Blay has said that his son should be separated from him because his son is a businessman and he is a, you know, a, a, a politician. And his son had even made a very generous offer of $200 million for the shares. Your thoughts on that? Isn't it just amazing that suddenly all their children have become so wealthy that they are able to do so many great things? These same people who were in this country not long ago, and they even have no shame about it. For me... That's what I'm saying. That it should be Ghana united to ensure that one, they are defeated, two, they are prosecuted for a clear message to be sent to everybody, including the NDC, that you don't turn governance to become a place where you profit, abuse office, and literally show that level of greed that we are seeing among them. I'm, I'm really shocked about them. Mm. The level of impunity simply amazes me. But there again, uh, that's his NPP for you. What is the NDC's plan to ensure that your own appointees don't do that. The thing is simple. Even in office in 2016, if there's one group that clearly had the capacity to take on people in government, even ensure that one of them was prosecuted almost, I mean, to the point of even being sentenced to jail, it was the same. One appointee of ours just whispered that, oh, I wish I could have access to $1 million. She was sacked from office. Imagine that. Meanwhile, you have an appointee that has what you call stack of millions of dollars in, in a bedroom. And the president actually said that, I am sure that you will be vindicated. Mm. It tells you the massive difference between the two. The, the fear is that perhaps the NPP may have shown the NDC the way. And when you come, you would want to take your own pound of flesh. It's not possible. It's completely not possible. I mean, if there is any group that is aware of the DNA of the NPP, it's us. 
it's true that we are not perfect. Mm. Some among us may literally may wanting to do that. But I can tell you there is enough resolve, enough level of patriotism on our side to ensure that even those who may dare want to follow anything close to what the MPP has done, clearly will be, will be not just exposed, mm. but be dealt with. So I'm not, I'm not even sure any of them will even try it out. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's a pleasure, uh, Kemini. Uh, thank you once more for the opportunity. Indeed. Fifi Fiavi Kweti is General Secretary of the NDC. We've been having a great conversation here on the program. I'll see you same time next week. Bye-bye.